They will be starting in two minutes, everyone. Everyone get ready to settle down. I'm sorry, I think they drank somebody's drink. Is that somebody's drink? So that was yours, I gave it to you. Okay. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you all for coming out here today. Um, I know it's slushy. Uh, last time, actually, if we could, uh, yeah, uh, if you could have the music load down. You told them with the music. Yeah, you don't turn it off. Thank you. It's like a music video. <laughs> so um, I want to thank everyone. Last uh, month, uh, Nicole was scheduled to speak. At, oh wow, geez. Uh, was uh, scheduled to speak on January 18th, but we had the ice storm, so uh, you know it was kind of dangerous for everyone to get here. Uh, we did have a conservative comedian who happened to be in town that day to fill in. He was actually a, a past speaker, uh, Eric Gallup, and uh, he was quite funny, so we had a good time. And uh, I want to thank the Assemblywoman for coming again. Uh, I'll leave you <laughs> The weather situation uh, made people, uh, I guess, they're, they're not thawing out yet. But uh, it's beautiful outside right now, and I appreciate you coming to us and speaking. And uh, we're very happy to have you. And uh, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen. Good. Uh Afternoon, I guess. Afternoon, everyone. Um, I want to thank Glenn and, and the club for inviting me to speak. Um, actually, I think it's a great crowd. We have a nice turnout here, absolutely. And uh, the weather has been a little awkward, so I don't know. It's going to be 40 now, and it's going to be 17 tonight. So just everyone be careful later on, because certainly um, all this water that's running is probably going to ice up. So um, we'll see. We'll see what happens. But hopefully. Uh, well, it won't get too bad for no. the rest of this winter. Mm -hmm. The ground, sat on uh, Chuck did say only six uh, is early spring actually. So oh. let's see if he can hold true. Well, to you know, that. Uh, the last he's 84 um, uh, correct uh, percentage rating. Okay, so but uh, the last see. time, you know, the mayor off time. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> <hey>. <laughs> That's right. Just, just one of the one of the one of the things being hurt by this mayor. Yeah. <laughs> um, so it's been a real exciting uh, time this year in Albany. Uh, so far this session has certainly uh, brought a lot of necessary changes. Uh, specifically, I'm talking about uh, the removal of Sheldon Silver as a speaker, which is something that I have been advocating for since, uh, yes, you can applaud that. <laughs> I think that he has been the poster child uh, for term limits. And New York One actually uh, interviewed me on the day that he submitted his resignation and asked me what I thought. I said, look, I said, it, this man has been there. If there's ever been an argument for term limits, it's that Sheldon Silver was elected speaker when I was only 13 years old. And that he was, I wasn't even born yet when he was first elected to the assembly in 1976. So that just shows you um, how entrenched um, he has been, and the system has been, um, and it really is a necessary change, something that I've advocated for uh, in 2013, uh, following the sexual harassment scandals in the Assembly. Uh, he used um, taxpayer money to silence uh, two victims of sexual harassment. Now we're learning that he used taxpayer money for other purposes as well. Uh, and this week he was uh, indicted on three charges of fraud and extortion. And so um, he is still a sitting member of the Assembly. Um, he is, uh, comes in and votes like a member of the Assembly, representing his district. Uh, but upon conviction uh, in New York, if you are a state legislator, um, upon conviction you're forced to resign your office by law. So that, we'll see what happens um, as the trial um, gets underway. Um, since I've been in the Assembly, uh, I've seen 15 of my legislative colleagues in both the Assembly and the Senate either convicted indicted, convicted, or forced to resign. And so that just shows you out of, there's 213 of us, right? So that just shows you um, how, how often this type of activity takes place within the legislature. Um, so there's a couple of uh, legis pieces of legislation that we've introduced in my conference under uh, Brian Cole, which would really sort of make some changes not only to the ethics laws, 
But I think some of the things that we propose would really make the institution of the assembly much better um, by allowing um, all the members to equally represent their communities. As you know, the way Sheldon Silver operated things, it looked more like a little dictatorship than an actual democracy. Um, and as a minority assembly member on the Republican side, things, gotten so, he, things had gotten so bad under his leadership that last year, um, myself and, and Joe Borelli, who were the two uh, Republican assembly members from New York City out of 64, there's only two of us, um, the two of us weren't even allowed to sponsor a legislation that we actually joined the mayor in, in, in announcing which provided a property tax rebate for Sandy. My district was most affected by this legislation than any other district in the state of New York. And Sheldon Silver wouldn't allow myself or Joe Borelli, the other New York City member, to add our names as co-sponsors of this legislation. That's how ridiculous it got under Sheldon Silver. And many other members um, were told, don't allow Republicans to co-sponsor your bills. And even went so far as to say, don't even take Republican bills. So. Oftentimes what would happen is because we were such a minority, we would give legislation to a Democratic sponsor, so we'd have a majority sponsor and it could pass. Um, even that was not good enough anymore for Sheldon Silver. Even stealing our ideas wasn't acceptable to Sheldon Silver anymore. So that just shows you how crazy things had gotten. And um, while ideologically I don't agree uh, with Carl Hasty, I'm sure, on many issues, uh, I do believe he is a consensus builder and is someone who will be more likely uh, to work with the Republican conference, and I think he's expressed um, that type of sentiment to our leader, which I'm very excited about, because I think that's really a new beginning. But with that has to come certain things. I mean, we've been pushing um, term limits. We're not gonna get term limits passed um, for everyone within this legislature, but we can get them possibly done for leadership. So all leadership positions, like the speaker, like the minority leader, uh, like the county chair, like the, um, the committee chairs, can uh, have term limits. So that way not one person is so entrenched for so many years, as Shelley was for 20 years as speaker, um, it allows it, it to rotate, fresh ideas come, new, new management, new leadership. So I think that's um, one important thing that we're looking to do. We also don't believe that speakers should have control of a slush fund of taxpayer money the way Shelley did, which is why he was able to silence victims of sexual harassment with taxpayer money, which is why he was unilaterally allowed to um, give grants to a doctor who then in turn um, made, made uh, referrals to his law firm. Um, this is the type of thing that we, we believe can really make the institution better. Another big thing is um, allowing legislation to come to the floor for a vote if it has enough sponsors to pass. You need 76 um, votes to pass a piece of legislation in the assembly. And we have bills that have more than 76 sponsors from both parties. Um, mixed martial arts is an example. The education tu tuition tax credit bill is another example. A lot of the women's equality bills separately have been introduced, like the human trafficking bill. Um, and that's also something that has been held up. All three of these bills have had over 76 sponsors, yet one person and one person alone was able to stop them from coming to the floor for a vote. And that's not a democracy. So we've made the argument that if, if a bill has enough sponsors to pass on the floor, it should be brought up and allowed to have an up and down vote. Um, other things that we've introduced in terms of ethics laws, uh, we think that you can't give a grant to somebody uh, to a family member's organization, nonprofits. We've seen like Pedro Espada, uh, Shirley Huntley, uh, both sitting in jail right now, and they're both um, they're both were convicted of using nonprofits to embezzle funds. Um, they created nonprofit organizations, sent taxpayer money that way, and then took it for their own purposes to live a lavish lifestyle. Uh, both sitting in jail, and by the way, they're both sitting in jail collecting your taxpayer money in the form of pensions, which is the other thing we want got stripped. Um, that takes constitutional amendment. Uh, we could have had it done <clears throat> by now had we passed it back in 2011 when myself and many of my colleagues have said this should be include, included in the ethics reform bills that we passed at that time. Um, so that's one of the big issues coming up now and we believe that this year we can actually get that done. But again, it's a constitutional amendment which means that you've got to pass it this term, you've got to pass it again next term, and then it's going to be sent to the voters. So it's going to take quite some time uh, before that can become uh, the law. 
So it won't affect, unfortunately, people uh, like Sheldon Silver, Carl Kruger, you know, uh, or anyone else who's in the legislature now, and is, and, and is uh, if they are convicted. So, um, going on to my next uh, issue that I want to talk about is this week I sent a letter to uh, Mayor De Blasio, and you know I'd really like to like open up the newspaper like just one day. Just one day, open up the newspaper and not see something completely ridiculous that this city council is actually doing. Um, and it, it almost sounds as if it's a parody because you don't even believe that they would actually do something like this. But with this municipal ID program that they uh, they passed, which many of us were opposed to originally, but now they made it even worse by they included a clause in the legislation that allows them to determine by 2016 if they want to, stri to shred, uh, destroy all the records of all the applicants. So this is, this is what's happening. They, they just started issuing these IDs this week. Uh, they anticipate about 500,000 individuals will receive this ID. Many are not um, residing in this city or this nation legally. Um, but aside from that, they've made it very easy for these cards to be obtained. So if you are in a homeless shelter for 14 days, um, you can get a letter from the homeless shelter, and you're allowed to then apply to get one of these municipal ID cards. So the residency uh, requirements are kind of lax, and um, my concern with this is that now they estimate about 500,000 ID cards will be issued under this municipal ID program, and then in 2016 they plan on destroying all the records because they're afraid. Literally, they said, it was quoted, a Tea Party Republican may come in and request the records of these individuals. So I find this to be, I mean, let's forget about the presidential stuff. Just the fact that they would issue 500,000 ID cards and then just consider destroying the records so we don't know who those 5,000 people are who have a government issued ID is insanity, especially in a post 9-11 world, especially with all the threats of, of terrorism that are not only here, especially in New York City, but across the world. Um, that they would consider doing something like this because I think it's extremely dangerous. If you look at the 9-11 Commission report, they said that all the hijackers but one had fraudulent ID. They all used fake aliases to obtain um, documentation or to obtain an ID of this type um, to access car rentals, airplane lessons, whatever it was. That they, you know, A lot of different things that they were able to do under a fake alias. So that's my concern. My concern is we're going to give 500,000 ID cards out there, and then we're going to consider destroying. So I wrote a letter destroying all the records so we don't know who these people are who have these IDs. I um, sent a letter to the mayor, to the council speaker, and to the two sponsors of the bill. One, one's from here, Councilman Menchaca, who's uh, a couple of uh, blocks away from my neighboring uh, Sunset Park, um, asking them if they've even talked to anyone in the Department of National uh, Homeland Security. Have they spoken to NYPD counterterrorism? Have they um, thought about the ramifications of destroying these records so we have no idea who is holding a government issued ID? And have they thought about people using fraudulent um, ali alias aliases or documentation to obtain such an ID? And so I anticipate a response, and I think that would be appropriate. Um, but we'll see. And we really have to. Um, to talk about this, and we got to get it out there. We got to get the media pick up on it because I think what they're doing is something really uh, could be detrimental to the city of New York. I think it's it's just crazy that they're even entertaining this idea. Um, so that's the second thing. Um, and aside from that, you know, I, I I'm actually going to open it up for questions because I think you know we can have a dialogue. If you guys can ask me, we can have more of a conversation type thing. Um, but I'll tell you that you know in Albany this year. A couple of the things that I anticipate fighting against, like fighting against again, which is it's become sort of our role in the assembly minority, is uh, we're sort of the ones who are the checks and balances. We hold the majority accountable. Um, we are the opposition party. We fight back on bad legislation, uh, oftentimes more than we push our own personal um, legislation. I mean, that's just the, the role we're in is always to push back on bad pieces. Uh, legislation. A couple of these bills, which I think are um, really don't respect the taxpayer, is uh, number one, using taxpayer money to fund political campaigns. 
And Governor Cuomo actually said that this is the answer to our ethics problems is to allow politicians to take your money to match political campaign contributions with a six to one match. So we're gonna we're gonna legalize the embezzlement. That's what that's what we're gonna do. So that way and that'll fix all our ethics problems, um, which is unconscionable to me that th that this is the solution they're putting forth. Um, and the second one that comes up every year, and I'm, I'm out there always talking about how this is just ridiculous um, because of the needs that our citizens have, is uh, the DREAM Act, which would use taxpayer-funded tuition assistance and give it to those who are in the country illegally when we have so many of our citizens um, graduating with enormous amount of debt. Uh, 26000 is the average debt a, a, a New York college student graduates with, and that's only for undergrad, not including graduate school. Uh, in fact, graduate school, if you're a graduate student in this state, you don't qualify for any tuition assistance at all because they eliminated back in 2010 when they, the Democrats had a two-party control, had a one-party control over all levels of government. They drove up the deficit to $13 billion and then they had to cut a lot of stuff. Uh, one of the things they cut was the tuition assistance program, which we have not restored yet. So instead of restoring the, the TAP program for graduate students in the state and looking at the income eligibility to increase it so more middle class families can qualify for assistance, they're pushing the DREAM Act. Um, so I have two pieces of legislation with Senator Andrew Lanza that would instead, do what I said, restore, restore TAP for graduate students and increase the income eligibility from 80,000 household income, which is where it's at now, to 100,000. Uh, if you are a family of four, five, whatever, three kids, you gotta put through school, um, and you have a mortgage, and you have all other expenses that an average middle class family has, you can't afford to put your kids through school on $80,000 household income. So the last time that was increased, by the way, was in the year 2000. So it's been 15 years since they increased that income eligibility cap. Um, so I think they need to increase it again. The number I proposed was 100,000. Both of my pieces of legislation, by the way, would cost less than the DREAM Act that's been proposed. And I think certainly our citizens should be a priority and that's, I'll uh, continue to maintain that position and, and fight. But I gotta tell you, like, I'm tired of fighting against this bill. This, this bill has come up three times for a vote last year. Three times. Like we have nothing else to talk about but this. Um, so that's sort of like, in a nutshell, and what I'm doing, what I'm working on, and I will open it up for questions. Thank you. Yes, okay. The um, ID form, mm -hmm. there was a lady who came on the TV, and she openly admitted that she made up a social security number. So when she went to get her ID, there was conflict because she used somebody else's name. She made up a um, false uh, social security and there was a problem for her. Another thing, I have no problem with uh, profiling. If the government profiles somebody and they've done nothing wrong, then there's nothing. And if they profile to, uh, for safety, I have no problem. Okay, so more comments and questions. But no, I, I, I appreciate your comments. Yes? I, I read the same, I read that article about the, by 2016 what they want to do mm -hmm. now. With, with your bill, you know, um, because of the fact that you're, you're fighting an uphill battle with them, you know, shouldn't it be, you know, consistently put out there that that information, especially everything going on right now with ISIS and, mm -hmm. and everything going on throughout the world, that, we don't know if people are going to try to even come to the city now and get that ID and have something that they're walking around legitimately with. Well, I'll tell you, the other day, uh, actually the day I wrote the letter, ironically enough, there was a uh, CNN, I believe it was, um, my friend sent a photo of the TV and sent it to me and said, uh, ISIS leader, we'll see you in New York, is yeah, what yeah. he said. Um, so, I mean, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, it, it, there should be real serious concerns. I mean, Italy has already expressed concerns um, that ISIS members are posing as migrants and coming into their, you know, they were at the UN Security Council um, expressing that concern. So I mean, it's not, you know, it's not something that's impossible, and it's certainly something that we should be aware of and concerned of. But it, it, it's, it's just anyone. I mean, the, the whole thing was when we, when the, the original opposition to these IDs was expressed, 
um, the city said, well, this will actually make us safer because we'll know who is in our city. We'll know who's residing in that city. Right. This will help identify them. And then here you go now. They're saying we're going to destroy all the 